anytime you care about someone else, it leads your life in a different path. And that's definitely what happened to me. And now that I've seen firsthand the challenges that these individuals face, I want to do everything that I can to make the world a better place for people just like them. My name is Jane Cummins. My passion is working with adults who have intellectual disabilities. I started the HEART program in 2002 with just the idea of doing something for people with intellectual challenges. So I actually um, started working on the paperwork at home and in my study just sort of filed for the not-for-profit status, not really knowing what it would eventually lead to. But then after talking with other family, other parents, other teachers, other community leaders, we ended up coming up with the idea for the programs that are now known as the HEART program. And we opened the doors for a training facility on February 1 of 2006. HEART stands for Housing, Entrepreneurship, and Readiness Training. And the whole idea of HEART is to create real, real world job opportunities for people with special needs so that they're actually living and working in jobs that really exist. And that seems so obvious to so many people, but it's really not obvious right now that those opportunities exist. In fact, they don't exist. So a lot of programs for people with special needs involve them working in the back in a warehouse or doing gardening or painting pottery or things like that, which are really great activities and really enjoyable. And sometimes they can even be paid through those activities. But if they leave those programs, it's very unlikely that someone would hire them to paint pottery in a company, right? So what we do at heart is try to focus on jobs that really exist, um, that are marketable and competitive, that once they get the training at heart, they're then able to go into the real world and find that employment. So even if they moved out of Houston, where our program is operating now, or if they moved you know, to another state, they could hopefully find work in the training that we're providing them. HEART is providing the education foundation that they need after high school when they graduate from special education. It's also providing the job training and the skills training that they need. And then also going that step forward to provide that job opportunity and employment. And all of those services are then wrapped around the individual so the person goes seamlessly from one to another. So they could be training for a job and we could be at a job site working with them and then they need additional training. So the next day they're back in the training facility working on that. They may need to work on an educational objective to get there. They'll go back in the classroom and they can move back and forth even in one week between all of those different modules to really get the services that they need. I feel like a lot of times people, when they develop a vocational training program, start with, well, what can they do or what can I teach? And the real starting point should be what jobs are available and then matching the individuals to those jobs and then developing the training that will prepare them for that job. So that's what we've done at the HEART program is to actually look at jobs that are in high demand, that are fairly low skilled, so they're jobs that our clients with developmental disabilities could learn how to do and then meeting with those employers and talking to them and visiting with them at length about what is required for those jobs. And then myself and my team, we go and we personally learn those jobs. So one of the jobs we teach is how to make a Papa John's pizza, for example. So I actually went to Papa John's and learned how to make a complete pizza, how to do everything from the fresh dough to all of the fresh sauce and cheese. And they do have the freshest ingredients that makes the better pizza. Um, but I learned it, that entire process so that then I could teach that to our trainees at the HEART program. And everyone on our team learned that process. And it's not just about how to make the pizza, but it's about how to talk to your coworkers, how to wear the uniform, and all the other standards that Papa John's has in their company. So the HEART program is all about removing barriers. And so one of our training programs is teaching people with special needs how to stock and service vending machines. Now picture a guy that would have a vending route, or a woman. You'd have to have probably your own truck. You'd be have to be able to drive the truck. You'd have to be able to load and unload products off the truck. You'd have to be able to go in and count and do inventory, pull money out, count the money, right? Just to run a, a simple vending route. Now think about our clients with disabilities. They might not be able to drive. 
They might be in wheelchairs. They might not be able to lift things on and off a truck. They might not be able to count money. How are we at heart going to teach these individuals how to run a vending machine route? And yet they do all of it. It's because we've re removed all those barriers. So they can't drive, okay, fine, we drive them. They can't load and unload things off the truck, okay, we have dollies, we adapt you know, the business to suit that. We pre-fill bins of products that they pre-fill in advance so that when they get there, they're just taking one bin off of the truck. So we've gone through that entire process of running a vending machine route and adapted it. When they get back here, they go in our money room, they count the money, we have machines, we have coin counters, you know, dollar bill counters. They wrap the coins, they sort them, they can make a deposit slip, we can drive them to the bank. So they can do everything in the business, um, but we've adapted it for them, right? When someone comes to the heart program and they have that dream job in mind, so someone might come and say, I wanna be a computer programmer, or I wanna be a police officer. Well, I might look at that individual and realize that that person may not be able to read or write or type. And so when I interact with that individual, the last thing I want to do is dash their dream and tell them, well, you'll never do that. Because you know what? No one ever did that in my life. You know, no one ever told me I was never going to be a ballet dancer. No one ever told me I wasn't going to win Ninja American Warrior, right? People said, oh, is that what you want to do? Well, then take these classes, do this, and here's the steps to do that, right? So if you're at the University of Texas and you want to take a class, there's a prerequisite. So before you can take the class you really want to take, you have to take the prerequisite class. Before you can take that, you have to take the prerequisite. You might have to score something on a test. So it's really clear what the steps are to move in your chosen field. And you know, if you want to be a doctor, you have to score a certain amount on your entrance test. And you have to take certain classes as an undergraduate, right? So it's pretty clear how you can get to be a doctor. And not everybody who wants to can get there, but everyone knows the steps it's going to take. And I think for the clients that we serve at heart, it's not as clear to them what the steps are. So if someone comes and they say, I want to be a police officer, we have to break that down for them. And we have to say, okay, police officers wear uniforms, right? So let's practice wearing uniforms. That's a good place to start. Do you know how to make sure that you're wearing the right uniform every day? Okay, police officers need a badge. Let's practice in a job where you have to wear a badge. Police officers have to be on time. So let's talk about how to be on time for work, you know? And then gradually you work your way into the things that are gonna be more tricky. But you start by identifying things that are pretty common for most jobs and make sure that folks feel like they're working towards their goal, you know? Yeah. And sometimes people will surprise you and they'll be able to do more than even you thought. And if you had dashed their dream in the beginning, then you would never see what they could actually do when they're more motivated. Looking back at that time when we were starting the HEART program, there were many people who thought that I was courageous or would tell me I was brave to sort of leave my career behind and go do something so radically different. But to be honest with you, I didn't feel at the time that there was anything brave about it. I felt that it was necessary and that it was the right thing to do and that anybody in my position would have done the same thing. I see people all the time doing extraordinary things for their kids or for their family or for loved ones who have illnesses or cancer or going through other treatments. And from my perspective, what I've done by creating the HEART program is really just the same thing or an extension of that love to want to make the world a better place for someone you care about and um, by extension other people that form part of that community. So. Yes, there's been a lot of uncertainty along the way in terms of, you know, would the organization flourish? Um, would others be attracted to our mission? Would people want to donate money to see the work happen? Because nothing we do is possible without donations as a not-for-profit organization. Would people want to serve on our board of directors? Would other families want to send their family members to a program like this? Would companies hire these individuals that we believe that, that we could teach them to work, but would anyone hire them afterwards? And so there was a lot of uncertainty, and there still is, quite honestly, just eight years later. But it's been very rewarding to see that some of the original objectives have been successful and that there is a lot of interest in the work that we're doing. And so that's really motivating to make sure that we continue it. And it's not so much about you know, what I would dream now, it's a shared dream that many people on our board or the families that come here or the community want. 
And so even some ideas that I have have been taken in a completely different direction because now it's a dream of multiple people that want the best for this community. So it's enabled us to even do more than I ever thought would ever be possible. Being where I am now, that I would have done completely different training and education for my own self so that I could be better at my job. Um, so I've had to learn a lot during the journey. Um, so when you start a not-for-profit organization, you have this idea that you're going to do a program. But along with that comes the responsibility of you know, organizational management, certainly HR responsibilities, accounting responsibilities, um, all different kinds of challenges that I was really not prepared for. And luckily, I've been able to use my network from University of Texas and through the community and other organizations where I volunteered to help fill in those gaps where my knowledge or my preparation hasn't been maybe where it could have been. Um, but other people smarter and more talented and more educated in those fields have been able to come and help and provide you know, legal advice, reviewing contracts or leases or um, just accounting advice or you know, any number of areas of expertise. You know, just right now at heart, our air conditioning is broken on one side of the building. You know, this is the kind of thing I know nothing about, but there are other people who, you know, come to our rescue and help and are able to sort of negotiate those repairs for us and just make it all happen. So it's definitely something that takes a lot of knowledge, but I find that that whole knowledge doesn't have to come from one person. You know, and I think that's the beauty of being involved with a not-for-profit as opposed to starting maybe a for-profit company where you take all the risk but you potentially have all the reward. In a not-for-profit, you're taking risk but the community's in there risking their donations and their heart and soul with you and the community gets the reward at the end if you're successful. So it feels more like a shared effort. You know, people don't talk about this a lot but a not-for-profit can't be sold. So you're gonna pour your heart and soul into this passion, and at the end of the day, you literally have nothing to show for it other than the good works that you've helped create. And so if you're not in a position to be able to do that, it can be a real struggle. And I think many organizations fail because of the financial impact and the financial toll that it takes. Not only are you not benefiting financially in any way, but you're more than likely putting money into it. And it's different than putting money into a business that you're starting because someday you may get that money back. In a nonprofit, you're truly putting that money in with no hope that it will ever come back because it's a donation. You're giving that away. You're giving your time. You're giving your money away. So I think it really is important to be aware of those considerations. The other thing is, I remember when we were first starting the HEART program, and I asked everybody that I could think of to help. You know, um, people that I knew from school, people in my family, um, neighbors, um, just really anyone through any of my networks. And many people helped, and many people didn't. And you have to learn not to take that personally. It's not any reflection on me or the work of the program, but sometimes it can feel that way. So it's important to kind of keep some distance. There were also people who stopped taking my phone calls <laughs> and I had to be really realistic and realize that, okay, every time I'm calling this person, I'm asking for them to volunteer or for them to give money or for them to help in some way or lend advice. And so it changed the nature of some of my friendships. And so I just had to be aware of that. Um, but if you don't ask people, then they won't give. So that was the best piece of advice somebody gave me when I was hesitant about asking people for help, is the example of the Girl Scouts. So most people, if the Girl Scouts knock on your door, you're gonna buy a box of cookies. But if the Girl Scouts don't knock on your door, right, you don't buy the cookies. And the only reason is because they didn't ask. No one asked that year. You know, you're not gonna call the Girl Scouts and say, hey, I'm ready for my cookies. Here's my money, right? Mm -hmm. But if they ask you, you'll probably buy the box of Girl Scout cookies. You're not asking someone to give money for you. You're asking someone to give money to help this greater mission and this greater purpose. And some people will be very compelled and excited to do that, and they want the opportunity to help something as exciting as what you're working on. And so that, you know, every time someone gets excited about it, 
then the multiplier effect of that is great because they'll tell their friends and people they know and get more and more people on board. So it's important to overcome that obstacle and go out there and ask because in doing that, you excite the community around you.